Hello, we are um, having a session with Kai Arnu now, and he's talking about Python and MariaDB. Is it a good match? Um, Kai does not have slides, but he will have um, documents to share afterwards. So we, that is what we'll be listening to today. Thank you, Kai. Take it away. Okay, thank you. So welcome to my talk on Python and MariaDB. I'm I seem to have a problem. I've lost Kai, but we'll get him back and we'll carry on with the talk in a moment. That back. Where's Kai? Okay. There we go. I hope I will be connected. The, the distance is long here. So, did you hear any of? Uh, Kai, we did not. You, we lost you. If you can start over, please. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm live. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry about that. Um, I am in a developing area of Germany in Munich, as it is the city center of of one of the biggest IT areas in in all of Germany. But I am. Uh, <clears throat> Sad to say that that internet connectivity is not what it should be. So um, I'll start again. So welcome to my talk on Python and MariaDB. I'm, I'm asking whether they are a match. And I, uh, the short answer to that question, in my opinion, is yes. But I will try to make it worth your while to hear me out on my reasoning during the uh, coming half an hour. So, uh, my name is Kai Arne. I'm the uh, CEO of the MariaDB Foundation. I'm based here in Munich, in Germany, and I'm just back from Finland, where I met with uh, Mika Videnius, with Monty, the uh, founder of MariaDB Foundation, and also the father of both uh, MySQL and, and MariaDB. So, the format of this presentation is not going to rely on a lot of slides or even any slides at all. So my goal is for you to get value out of this presentation in two ways. First, by listening to what I have to say right now. And second, by a blog entry with links and numbers and hard facts, uh, things that are best conveyed in, in writing. And that's going to be my weekend writing job. But you can sit back and relax and now Ask yourself whether it makes any sense when I say that MariaDB server is relevant for you as a Python developer. But uh, before going into Python and MariaDB, I will go into a couple of basic facts and observations. So the first one is on MariaDB Foundation, which is something different from MariaDB Corporation. So the Foundation is a small organization with just 10 people focusing on three things, on openness, on adoption, and on continuity. We take code contributions and we merge them into the code base, which is on GitHub. And we do what it takes to increase the adoption of MariaDB server without regard to whether the user is a customer of, of any organization or not. And the third uh, item, continuity. By that, we mean to ensure that the openness and the adoption goals continue to be supported and pursued, regardless of what MariaDB Corporation does. If it's continuous as it is, if it's acquired, if it goes on a stock exchange or whatever. So MariaDB Corporation has 250 people, and that's a classic startup, venture capital owned. It's striving for profit. And they uh, employ most of the core developers of MariaDB server. Although we at the foundation also um, get a lot of code contributions from 
other sponsors. And other sponsors of MariaDB Foundation would be, for example, Microsoft, IBM, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, ServiceNow, Intel, uh, DBS Bank in Singapore. Uh, we are MariaDB.org and they are MariaDB.com and we are independent entities. So I also want to thank you for having me here at PyCon South Africa. So from a flying around and queuing in immigration perspective, I'm very happy that I can sit here in my home office in Munich, but I have only been twice in South Africa and a live audience is always a live audience and I would love to have face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I do know how to say Huyamidach in Afrikaans and I've also practiced to say Sawubona and Mulweni in Zulu and Kosa, and I know that's only a fraction of the languages uh, in, in South Africa. I come from Finland, where we have Finnish and Swedish, so I'm used to the fact that there's many countries, many languages in the country. But then on to Python, because that's the uh, that's the, the topic here. I will argue that Python and MariaDB are a good match. But in order for you to be able to judge whether to give that argument any weight at all. I'll describe my, shall we say, coding credentials, if you will. So I started out as a programmer in the 1970s and 80s, but perhaps sadly I moved on to management in the 1990s as the founder of a startup in my native Finland. And that startup got acquired by MySQL AB, and I was then serving in, in uh, various vice president roles. Um, uh, and community VP roles in engineering and community relations at MySQL AB, the company behind MySQL, and then Sun Microsystems as it got acquired, and Oracle, and then MariaDB Corporation. And then I joined MariaDB Foundation as CEO in February 2019. So that does sound like a sad distance from programming, and it partly was. But coding is good for your sanity. That's what I think. So I started out on the TI Texas Instruments 58 in the 70s, followed by basic and a bit of assembler on uh, Swedish computers, Z80 based computers called ABC80 and ABC800, together with uh, my schoolmate Mikael Montividenius. And I was impressed by APL, a programming language or mainframes, before setting on the fourth, so called fourth generation language, Focus, which formed the basis for my first company, Polycon, and also my first visit to uh, Cape Town and Johannesburg. So then, after a visual basic period, a Delphi period, and a brief PHP per period, um, I moved out of programming into management for well over a decade, only to realize then in 2011 that Python is good for mental well-being. So I made a short venture into geodata with Python and left some superficial but still traces on GitHub. And now I'm back to normal sanity, as normal as it can get, and coding in Python whenever applicable. Time allowing at the end of, of, of this presentation on Python and MariaDB, I will share some observations on how I saw like 90% of all the earlier pain points in programming being, being solved when I came back home, back home to Python in a world that had changed in that over a decade when I was off program. But now for the match between Python and MariaDB server. So the question I want to answer is this. When is MariaDB server the right choice for persistence of data in, in Python? And I also detail that question even in the abstract of this uh, speech. So I split it into why is picking a database sexy to begin with? And why a relational database, not no SQL? And then why a, an open source relational database? And then fourth and last out of those, why MariaDB, not MySQL or Postgres? And also when not to pick? Maria D. So <clears throat> I'm trying to make uh, give no nonsense answers, very very sort of trivial but top level, perhaps self evident answers to these questions, and let's see whether you agree. So 
The first one being, why is picking a database sexy to begin with? And the basic answer is, you need persistence. You need to uh, preserve state, save state from one session to the other or made centrally available to a central resource. And picking the right database will influence lots of things. It will influence cost, it will influence response time, and it will influence development time. So if you do the wrong choice there, you will have to pay in either uh, one or more of these currencies, cost, response time, and development time. So then, why a relational database and not no SQL like, like Mongo? Of course, we come into the question here of, of, of matters of taste, and I will uh, try to give you my logical answer to that question. And the question to answer to the question why a relational database uh, is base, uh, there's a basic answer it's mathematically sound it's theoretically clean it avoids problems in the long run before relational databases i used other databases in the 70s and 80s they were uh, hierarchical databases and network databases and they enabled it to store unclean or conflicting data it was even very easy to store conflicting data in there. So you got inconsistencies. And then moving the data on to a relational database forced you to clean up that data in, in clear structures where the inconsistencies were removed. So one can suffer a lot from these inconsistent data. And now, what does that have to do with uh, NoSQL? Well, <clears throat> NoSQL allows the very same type of inconsistencies as pre-relational databases. It is quick, but it's also dirty. So then, why open source? Why an open source relational database? The basic answer there is, it's financially sound. It avoids vendor lock-in. It costs as much as a Python does. It saves cost, and it doesn't just save cost in licensing. It saves on hardware, and it saves on, on maintenance, on development. So then, let's say you pick, you, you make your choice. Yes, it's, an, it's a database, it's a relational database, and it's an open source relational database. There are choices there. So why Maria did it? Why not MySQL, which is uh, more known, older? Why not Postgres? So there I have two different answers, one in relation to, to MySQL and the other one in relation to, to Postgres. So as opposed to MySQL, MariaDB is not dependent upon any individual large player owning another database. In MySQL's case, obviously, Oracle database. And Oracle has an agenda, which is not necessarily yours. So we at MariaDB want our database to be an alternative also to Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle database itself. And that obviously makes no sense for, for MySQL, out of logical reasons. So when it comes to Postgres, then the answer is a bit more complex. And it's also related to licensing, uh, because there are several open source licenses. So Postgres has a more permissive license. It's called BSD, uh, where MySQL and MariaDB license is called GPL version 2. So that's good for the user, right? It's more permissive. That sounds good. Well, it depends. Uh, BSD. Uh, has uh, so already in MariaDB there are no significant limitations on users of MariaDB. There are limitations on those who build extensions on top of uh, MariaDB and MySQL, and those limitations don't exist in Postgres. So with Postgres you, you know, can build closed source extensions. With MariaDB you cannot, and that uh, the fact that you cannot build closed source extension on MariaDB can actually be a benefit for users of MariaDB because uh, they get all new functionality on MariaDB server as part of MariaDB server because of the GPL version 2 license, which forces it to be that way. So that's the licensing part. Then there are, of course, technical differences on performance, on replication, etc. I want that's too technical to give a, a complete overview of that. But on the technical part, let me mention the storage engine 
architecture, which was started in Maya scale and has been partly abandoned there, but, but continues to thrive and live very well in Maria Dimir. So that means that there are two layers of Maria Dimir. The top layer where, where you talk the language, the protocol uh, that you're used to, uh, with the database, and then there's a storage layer, uh, which can be different for different types of use cases below it. So this allows MariaDB to have the same SQL and the same interface for OLTP and OLAP, OLAP. So it's for transactional and analytic, you can have the very, very same syntax on top, but uh, the storage uh, layer in underneath is very different because that gives you a very different uh, performance. So you can optimize by the choice of a storage engine. As for features, there are, uh, we have several good blog entries and several good videos about all kinds of uh, functionality in 10 from 10.0 onwards. Um, and one example that I, is very fresh that I could mention is the Python like F string formatting, that, that the F string that got into uh, Python 3. Uh, there's a formatting function called S format that came in MariaDB 10.7, which right now is only available as a pre preview uh, version. I'll provide a list of some of these in the blog entry that I promised, but let me from now, from now uh, highlight that uh, I think we're particularly strong in MariaDB in various types of replication and high availability. There are several security plugins. We have a JSON functionality that is always, uh, that is ever stronger for each release. Um, but the best, best way to get an overview of the functionality of each of the releases is to look at the release notes, which I will link. So the preview release is now 10.7, and going backward, you may want to read up on the functionality of 10.6, 10 10.5, 10 10.4, and so on. And I mentioned the Oracle compatibility as a feature. That's something that goes back all the way to 10.3. And that's an exciting thing where uh, it used to be the case 10 years ago, that people never migrate databases, never touch a working system. But there's a good reason to touch a working system, and that is money. So if you're pouring money out of the company because of, because of a closed source solution, it might pay off to, to migrate. And there are several interesting migration scenarios where people take their Oracle application and migrate it to MySQL, and they do so uh, through the compatibility layer of, MySQL, of, of MariaDB. Instead of, of uh, changing their application, they change uh, uh, MariaDB, the code itself. So, of course, that's something only a big organization can allow itself. But um, uh, the, the case in point here is Southeast Asia's biggest bank, DBS Bank, Development Bank of Singapore, who uh, over the course of a couple of years, migrated nearly every single one out of their Oracle applications to instead run on, on MariaDB through uh, asking the MariaDB developers to extend uh, the code on, uh, in, in MariaDB to support the stored procedures in the PL SQL language of, of, uh, of Oracle. So when should you then not pick MariaDB? <clears throat> So if you're happy with your current solution, both from a technical and from a cost perspective, why, why touch it? There's not much point in touching it. But especially with closed source solutions, the cost factor isn't usually all that happiness inducing. So now uh, I will proceed to the second level uh, of talking about the match between MariaDB and Python. Like what MariaDB server to pick which server version is it should be on cloud or on premise which python connector how often should you upgrade and is there other related software worthy of mentioning and worthy of picking so the answer to the question which server version that's easy 10.6 if you're now starting out go for mariadb server 10.6 for new development we have about one release a year and 10.7 is now only in preview stage. So, so build your new uh, versions of, on, on uh, 10.6. 
or new, your new applications. Then the, then the question, should you use it on cloud or on premise? That's up to you. The choice is yours. Uh, you probably make that decision uh, independently of, of a database and MariaDB is there uh, available on, on every one of the clouds. So you can use MariaDB in whatever cloud you're, you're, you're picking, or you can use it on-premise. Uh, that's, that's no different. It's the same MariaDB, although, of course, the clouds tend to lag behind so that the new functionality exists only if you run it on-premise, on, on except if you go for the uh, cloud solution from, from MariaDB Corporation, which is called SkySQL. They have, uh, have the latest versions also. But that's sort of behind, beside the point. You can pick your, your version. Uh, you probably will pick uh, whether to run on cloud or on premise for good reasons. I have no opinion on that one. Uh, but speaking of the cloud, <clears throat> I want to underline our Jupyter kernel. So the Jupyter kernels are not, of course, just about Python. You can have a Jupyter kernel for sort of anything. And we created one for, for uh, MariaDB. And with that Jupyter kernel, running it on Binder, you can, you can try out MariaDB 10.7 without even installing the database. So, so, so just try that out. It's, it's in our, on the blog entries of, of among the blog entries of MariaDB.org. So then there's also the question of which Python connectors, how do you connect between MariaDB and Python? So there's a MariaDB Python connector. And it's described in the so-called knowledge base, kb.mariadb.com. I have to say that's on kb.mariadb.com, but it's, it's still based on, shall we say, open source principles. And, and there uh, you have all the descriptions of how these, uh, how the MariaDB connector works. There's a specific MariaDB connector uh, supporting stuff that the MySQL connector to uh, uh, Python doesn't. There, there are ways of using that one as well, but I recommend, obviously, the MariaDB-specific uh, connector. And I'll provide the links in the upcoming blog entry to that. So then, how often to upgrade? Uh, so when you need a new feature, upgrade to a new major release. When there's a security fix, upgrade to a new minor release. So a new major release would be 10.7. A new minor release in the case of 10.5 would be 10.5.14. And uh, we make a strong distinction between uh, major and minor releases. We do not believe in the greenfield model that MySQL has, where they mix and match uh, new features and bug fixes. So new features uh, destabilize a release and, uh, and uh, uh, bug fixes stabilize it, and you will never get to a stable state stage, we believe if you mix them into uh, uh, the, the same, same release. Plus, it's very important from our perspective that uh, it should something go wrong, and anything can go wrong in, in, in IT, you should be able to migrate backwards. So say that this 10.5.14 minor release is, is uh, not working for some, uh, some strange reason, you should be able to migrate without any cost and effort back to 10.5.13. That is not the case if you have a greenfield uh, release. Such migrations do not work in, in uh, MySQL 8. So we joking, only half jokingly say that uh, Ma uh, MariaDB is more compatible with MySQL than MySQL itself. Then, of course, talking across the releases, across the, the, the major versions. Uh, and where should you download from, or where should you obtain uh, MariaDB from? Well, there's a Docker image. That there's, uh, uh, you can get it from your, your Linux distros, and you can get it from MariaDB.org. There are several ways of, of, of using it. Uh, and the one that you pick is dependent on your other habits. So if you otherwise always just use your Linux distro, everything you trust Debian for everything, go for it. Uh, if you want to use uh, the newest features, uh, you'll have to download them from us because uh, the newest versions might not yet 
have gone uh, all the way to the to the Linux distro. Uh, what other related <coughs> software to pick? Well, uh, there's one in particular that I wish to point out to you, and that's MindsDB. So machine learning, uh, it, of course, is a big theme in, in Python. And machine learning has lots of data. So it's sort of a no-brainer that lots of data requires a database, and, and machine learning requires Python. So that, that already should be a match made in, in heaven. And MindsDB is the combination of those two so uh, it stores uh, Python stuff semi-automatically in, in MariaDB and it, it has a prediction engine and, and like all of the good stuff that machine learning has and integrated into the database. So we have videos that introduce MindsDB and how it works. Just remember from now, for now that machine learning and MariaDB fit together with MindsDB. So then before the end, I, I promised to give you a short overview of my, what my reaction was when coming back to coding after well over a decade without it. And these might be trivialities for you, but they, it might also mean that, that stopping and, and looking back in the rear view mirror gives some insight about the current situation, which is not at all bad, I think. So um, I had the experience of coding both beautiful languages like APL or Delphi based on Pascal and ugly languages, PHP and Perl, and in between ones like Visual Basic. And now I realize I may have made some enemies already based on that classification into beauty and ugliness. But coming back to coding with Python and doing so on a Mac, my overall reaction was this is how coding should have been all along. Uh, but it's also about the environment outside of Python development. So first, the editor, Sublime Text or TextMate, could quickly accomplish stuff that shouldn't have been impossible 20 years earlier. Only nobody had created as usable editors back then. PyCharm as an IDE also compares very favorably to previous IDEs. Second, user interface design. There are now standard markup languages, HTML, JSON, XML, which uh, relieves the developer of coding lots of unnecessary stuff. There are standard tools for input and output. There's much less need for UI design, and to the extent needed, there are ready-made components. The environment, the basic configuration for the development environment is much more extensive. With every Mac, and same thing with Linux, obviously, comes a full development environment that contains tools that I had expected to have to buy or at least install separate. Open source, the components often come in source code form. Not that I need to change them that often, but when I look at the source code, I get it much quicker how to use it and can get inspired for how to write contemporary good code. Then operating system independence. The Python environment doesn't differ much between Mac, Windows and Linux. Well, Delphi tried it out, they, it never worked properly for anything but Windows. So now I need to focus much less on OS independent code, and frequently my code is used over the net anyway, and a few OS dependencies, they disappear totally. Program elegance. A caveat language issues are loaded also when it comes to programming languages, but Python and even J JavaScript are full of consistency and elegance in comparison to earlier, uglier languages. Then internet. Internet makes life so different from the 90s also for programmers. You can share your specs over G, your source code over GitHub, your test data over Dropbox. Internet is present for a developer community and for interfacing to, with the users, both of the above. So current results can be shown in no time as HTML or JPEG or in for, file format specific to your app even if the user is in a different country. And that's something that could hardly be imagined early 90s. Stack Overflow, that's the best of it all. So how do I use Python to calculate the distance between two points whose latitude and longitude are known? How do you convert dates? Any question. You can always cheat with the help of benevolent fellow programmers. There are definitions on Wikipedia and other documentation is present all over the place. So all of this might see, be self-evident to you as an audience uh, in this uh, century. And now it is so to me as well, but I took the pause to, to reflect back on what the huge differences that we see. And I think 
we should not forget how easy life is nowadays compared to earlier. So was everything worse before? Was it just the bad old days of programming? So I'm tempted to say that's the case. Unicode would be the only exception, and even that was fixed in Python 3. Before that, I was uh, bit by weird error messages. So if you take the four first character of my last name, Arne, A-R-N and O with two dots, you got A-R-N and half of the Scandinavian letter O with two dots. And the error messages were supremely obscure. I, I hit my head uh, several times in the, in the wall with that. So that wasn't much better last century either, but it was something that took ages to implement. A final point uh, on, on what was worse would probably be against Mac not having proper keyboard commands. So without the trackpad or the mouse, there's not much you can do on a Mac. That takes a huge toll on, on productivity, as there's a cost every time you have, need to take your hands off the keyboard and onto the trackpad. But that's no fault of any programming language anymore. So well, that was my rant with some perspective to earlier times and some color for developers who started coding this century. But regardless of when you started coding and what you did before Python, I'd argue that Python and MariaDB server are a match. And now I'm ready for any questions because this is 30 minutes and, and that's how much the, the presentation itself should be. Thank you. I don't know where I should get the questions. Ah, there will be somebody. Yes, now I see somebody. No. Question from Colette Matisse. And how, how many versions behind with the close with the cloud? Um, version of MariaDB on, for example, AWS, two, three years, probably. Any other questions? Yes. All right. So you, um, sorry, your internet's been breaking up a little bit. You say two, three years behind? Can you summarize that last answer again? No. Okay. And then when would I choose MariaDB over PostgreSQL? Um, when would I choose uh, MariaDB over Postgres? So uh, historically, that question was easier to answer. Uh, I'll take a, a short uh, an academic project with all the features and none of the performance. And uh, uh, MySQL, which is the ancestor of MariaDB, had all the performance and none of the features, of course, exaggerating here. So, so you would uh... perhaps we'll ask him to answer that question in the blog as well, Colette. And uh, you would choose MariaDB now uh, because things have developed. MariaDB has now got the features that it missed earlier on, and Postgres has got performance. So, so that's more of a historical uh, reasoning of, of, of how people ended up choosing it. So you would probably choose MariaDB if you're trained in knowing how, how to use MySQL and MariaDB, when you have the skill set of it. And you'll probably remain there, uh, whereas if you come from a Postgres background, that's, that's what you pick. If you now face the decision of, of having to pick either one, 
Um, I think uh, ability would be things that are particularly well supported in in Maria DB. But there are there are detailed uh, sort of other reasons for for, for picking. E to to simplify the choice of the user base uh, so uh, we have some comparisons and there are other uh, and, and posters thank you colette for that question thank you um i just want to note that your internet does lag sometimes so if that is a question you want to include in your blog perhaps um that might be worth worthwhile um, and I saw I was muted when I thanked you for your talk. I'm quite new to programming and I found this most interesting. So thank you very much. I'm sure I'll come back to your talk multiple times in the future. I don't hear anything um, here my side. So if you're saying something to me, I'm sorry. No. Uh, okay, well, I'm not muted. So let's try typing a question. Um, see if that is working. Okay, so we have more questions from Sia Bulela. Why do you think data scientists still at this point more seem reluctant questions. to work with databases? Yes, Sia Bulela Nato. Why do you think data scientists still at this point seem reluctant to uh, databases despite the advantages? They love CSV for us. Well, I have to say I made the opposite decision or opposite mistake when I went for Python because I'm a, I am was a brainwashed database programmer. So I thought anything needed to be in the database. Uh, in a situation where, where there's absolutely no need to, to use the database uh, because of the data being so, uh, from the quantity, so small that they, it fits into memory all the time. So you read a CSV file with memory and you deal with it in the memory and then you save it in a CSV file. And, and, and that's, that's something you can do if, if, if there's enough memory. Uh, and I think that's the basic, basic reason. If uh, the, the test case scenarios are so small that the amount of data doesn't warrant a, a database, and then uh, you sort of get by whenever the... I see we have another internet lagging. Uh, I'm wondering if it's perhaps better to take this offline um, and have a conversation on Discord, perhaps. Uh, okay, I'll turn off my video. Okay, I think um, his internet's a bit bad, so I think I'll end the, the session here for now. Thank you very much to Coach Arno. Um, and next we have a short break, and then we are coming back to the lightning talks at 5.25 South Africa time. Um, I hope to see you there. Um, and I think we'll share... Um, Kay did have his... He was going to share it in a blog, and so I think the conversation can carry on as comments to his blog. And we'll share it on, on this channel in Discord um, 
and wherever else we need to. All right, I think if there's no other questions, we will end the broadcast here. Okay.